Well, good morning, everybody. It's um, good to see everyone here, and um, so I'm so glad we have the youths here with us, um, worshiping together in this big family. Now, um, anyone here like traveling? Anyone? Well, just a few of you. Any anyone who is who has planned to travel um, next uh, the coming week? So you, so I won't see you here next Sunday, right? <laughs> okay, yes, yeah, okay. Um, a lot of people like to travel, right? Um, I I think um this because quite often we would see something different, um, something out of the ordinary that enriches us and prompts us to see things in new light. Um, two weeks ago, I was um, in Phuket, Thailand, and um, I, I had everything planned well, okay. I I was going to have breakfast as, at 9 o'clock and then finish breakfast before 10.30 and go back to the hotel room in order to watch our Cantonese um, service online. But one thing I just missed, Phuket was one hour behind. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, I ended up um, having my breakfast at the same time worshipping <laughs> next to the beach of course <laughs> well that was a nice experience and also um we after thailand we went to um malaysia and we went to penang um okay so you can see it. we visited this um wonder food museum and see they have got all sorts of um exhibition on food okay so you see the giant durian which is fake of course <laughs> and and also the shark fin um, um, banquet and you can see all the sharks la laying there well th those are fake of course uh, it's a message to tell people not to eat shark fins anymore okay um, yeah that looks really real and then um, th there's this picture okay so you, you see there's a table full of um, food you can you can't see what it is right there's a picture of mona lisa and then you look at this um here okay it tells you to look at the table from um the right in front of the table so what would you see what do you think you would see on the table yeah you see mona lisa laid out with food okay which is quite clever. And um, yeah, the same goes for reading the Bible. Sometimes we just need to approach the text from a slightly different angle, and then we will see a whole lot more. And um, well, remember on Lunar New Year's Day, I told you that at Yan Fuk, this year we would focus on deepening our spiritual growth. And this is the Year, the annual plan for this year. So this, uh, we are going to focus on deepen our spiritual growth to know Christ better and his relationship with his people, that means us. Okay. And to, um, through the Gospel of Mark. So today I'm going to continue on the series on the Gospel of Mark. And it is quite appropriate for us to study the ministry of Christ on on earth um, on this Palm Sunday. Um, the text we are going to look at is in Mark chapter 1 verse f verses um, 40 to chapter 2 verse 12 and we will be looking at two miracles. Wow, is that too much? Two, okay. Um, that Jesus performed in Capernaum, the small town by the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus stationed during most of the time during his ministry on earth. And when we read the Gospel of Mark, we have to bear in mind one fundamental question, and that is, it's taken from Mark chapter 8, 20, verse 29, but who do you th say that I am? That's Jesus said to the disciple. Who do you say that I am? Well, we may have heard a lot about who Jesus is from other people, but deep in our heart, do we really get who Jesus is? 
do we have the conviction? Mark had told the readers at the very beginning of the Mark Gospel in um, chapter 1, verse 1, right at the beginning. He says, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And through, um, throughout um, the Gospel of Mark, um, he wants us to see for ourselves what is so special about Jesus, that we may come to the same conviction the same conclusion as Peter, that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of God. Not because someone else tells us, but because we ourselves come to the conviction. So in the following two miracles, we begin our journey with the disciples to see for ourselves who Jesus is. The two miracles, they um, may seem unrelated. Okay, one is um, healing a leper, and the other one is healing a paralytic. But Mark put them back to back for a reason, and they have got more similarities than they look on the surface. So let's dive in and find out. Okay, so let's look at the first miracle. Let's read. Mark chapter 1 verses 40 to 45 together. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priests and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. Okay, well, we may have um, read this passage um, many times already, right? Who has um, already read this passage for more than 10, ten times? <laughs> oh yeah, some of you. Yeah, it's very familiar, right? So, um, yeah, so, we, we sometimes we we may just because um, the text is too familiar we may just skim through it. Okay, yeah. So Jesus um, healed a leper, and what's the big deal? Yeah, Jesus is, has got the power to do that. Um, well, I don't know how much you know about leprosy nowadays. It's pretty rare, right? Anyone who has encountered it, someone who is infected with leprosy before. No, well, the last time I I I, I could think of was um, when I was a kid. Okay, primary school kid, and um, one day a classmate said to me, "I was in contact with a leper yesterday, and I was so scared." <laughs> okay, well, fortunately, um, um, we were not infected. <laughs> okay, but um, see, leprosy is a really horrible disease. In ancient, well, see this um, picture. Um, are we are you seeing the picture? Okay, yeah, um, yeah. Those these are pictures with the people um, infected with leprosy. I don't know if Timothy has seen any. Yeah, because you're a doctor, right? But um, you haven't seen any. Okay, so this picture is um, a 24 years old man. Okay, infected with. Leprosy, and and that's a uh, a man who has got leprosy, and um, because they lost this sense, okay, of pain, so some they 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 could easily got their own fingers chopped off or uh, or burned um, and not noticing, okay. So it's really horrible. Uh, not only it looks horrible, but it's um, really a um, painful, well, painful way to experience a disease, and it's very, it can go on for years. 
And in ancient time, there was no cure for leprosy. And the only way to contain its spread was to have the lepers quarantined as instructed in Moses' law. And as we see in Leviticus um, chapter 13, it talks about leprosy. And a leper is proclaimed unclean, unclean. And he shall live alone. And his dwelling shall be outside the camp. Yes, yeah, so much about human right. Well, but um, since we have been through the pandemic for the past three years, we know quarantine has to be done for some um, infectious disease. And what is more, actually, Jewish people regarded leprosy as divine retribution, divine punishment. Anyone who was infected with leprosy was seen as someone who had done something bad morally because um, they were unclean internally. So the uncleanness showed up externally. And the Jews, they greatly feared leprosy, not, be, not only because of the physical damage done by the disease, but also of the strict isolation laws applying to leprosy, making patients feel like feared outcasts of the society. And as such, when we read in the, in the passage we just read, okay, um, what did Jesus do in verse 41? Jesus was moved with pity. And what did he do? He stretched out his hand and touched him. Okay, doctor, would you touch a leper if, the, if, if he comes to you to, to ask for um, your consultation? Would you do that? No way, right? You would want to wear this, right? Okay. Anyone who touch a leper runs the risk of being infected, and they themselves would become unclean according to Moses' law, right? And the other two instances in Bible where leprosy was healed were in the book of Numbers, uh, where Moses' sister Miriam was struck by God because of her rebellion, and also in the book of Second King, no, First King, no, Second King. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, the Syrian commander named Naaman. Um, was uh, was uh, with leprosy, and the agents of healing in both cases, Moses and Elijah, Elijah, they did not dare to touch them. Only Jesus dared to touch a leper. So what does this show us about Jesus? It tells us that Jesus was a disinfectant, sanitizer, antiseptic. <laughs> well, he did not get contaminated by touching a leper. On the contrary, by touching the leper, he cleaned the leprosy. Not only physically, mind you, but also the uncleanness deep inside the affected person in our lives, although we may look beautiful and handsome on the outside, but from time to time we know we may have some ugly sins, uh, something horrible like leprosy inside ourselves. And we remember we may always reach out to Jesus and ask him, if you will, you can make me clean. And we can assure that Jesus would answer, I will be clean. And even um, in the text, we see that the lab, well, Jesus ordered the man to not to tell anybody, right? Um, that is because um, it's going to cause him um, 
great um, problem um, when he goes when he goes from place f to place because um, people w would gather around. But um, um, do you think Jesus already knew that the man would just go around and spread out the word everywhere? Yeah, Jesus probably knew, but um, Jesus still healed the man. So we can come freely to Jesus to ask for his cleansing. And s let us look at the next story. Um, Jesus had the authority to forgive, and I say um, here, watch his words. Now let's read the second passage. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home, and many were gathered together, so that there was no more room, not even at the door, and he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof about him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic li lay. Um, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, and said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Well, again, um, I just said, um, in those days, the Jews regarded um, leprosy as a divine retribution. And similarly, the Jews thought that um, it's also divine punishment, being a paralytic. And also in John chapter 9, we see here, there was a blind man who, who was born um, with this, um, um, what do you call that, um, vision in, in parity, right? <laughs> So they asked Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So we see that um, in those days, if you are infected with any serious um, disease or disability, people regard you as, a, as, as having received divine punishment. Now, um, of course, um, in the, because of John, Jesus said, um, well, it's not because of this, uh, this man's sin or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So, well, everybody sinned, right? Everybody has sinned. And we, we know that um, the... Um, Disability or the disease is not necessarily a um, divine retribution, but in those days, that's how people believed. And in this incident, Jesus could have just skipped to the last sentence and told the paralytic to rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Why did he have to say, your sins are forgiven? Did he not know he would provoke the scribes with these words? Of course he knew, and he said these words on purpose because he wanted the people to know who he was. 
Why were the scribes so angry with Jesus? Um, they were so angry. Why does this man speak like this? He is blaspheming. Okay. Well, didn't we, we would ask, didn't the people in those days make sin offerings and ask the priest to intercede with God for them? Uh, well, the Jewish view is that only God, not the priest, forgave sins. Priests only perform atonement rituals and pray for people. And we know of no text that records a priest saying, your sins are forgiven. And claiming to forgive sins was not a common occurrence in those days. All sins <coughs> are ultimately offenses against God. If only the one being offended may forgive the offense, then the right to forgive sins is a uniquely divine f function. <coughs> and that's why the scribes regarded Jesus as blaspheming, because Jesus, with his words, he was claiming divine authority. And the scribes did not believe he was God. Now let me ask you this question also. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk and go home? Raise your hand if you think it's easier to say to a paralytic, rise, take up your bed, and walk, and go home. No? Nobody? Or is, is it easier to say to him, your sins are forgiven, which is easier? Yeah, of course, it's saying your sins are forgiven is easier because it's something you cannot verify, right? It's internal, right? There's no way of um, proving it. But the result of saying, rise, take up your bed and walk, can be see has to be seen externally. And uh, if after you say that and the man still lay there, could not move, your cover would be blown immediately. So action speaks louder than word. By showing the people he had the power to make a paralytic walk, Jesus showed the people he had the authority to forgive sins, just like he said, so that you may know the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. And by doing so, in fact, he was showing the people he was God. Now let us also take note of verse 5. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, obviously the paralytic had the wish to be healed, but it was the faith that was shown through his friend's action that Jesus acted. If they did not, um, if they did not um, bring the man um, to Jesus through the roof, okay, if they did not do that, I'm not sure Jesus would reach out to the paralytic to, and heal him. So sometimes we may encounter difficulties in life and we try to face it all alone. But we should know that the faith of our fellow Christians can be more effective than facing it alone. So in the future, if you happen to go overseas to study and you are alone, make sure you go to find a church and have fellow Christians so you have the support together. Now, brothers and sisters, we see that Jesus, through his miracles of healing, showed us that not only he was able to heal a person physically, he also showed us he had the authority to clean us internally. In fact, he showed us he is God. 
So no matter if you feel like you are the leper or the paralytic spiritually, you may always come to Jesus to ask for his help. So let's remember this and continue to renew our thinking and understanding of Jesus and his relationship with us to know Jesus better so we may experience different spiritual growth. Now let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you because you are God with us. You are Emmanuel and you have come to this earth to show us who you really are. You are the Christ, the Son of God. And Lord, um, in this um, Holy Week leading up to Good Friday, let us um, let us know more about you. Let us um, have a different relationship with you and let us be able to appreciate more your sacrifice on the cross and your grace. And Lord, um, we thank you for your grace and um, be with us this coming week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.